As we grow up, we change a lot. We learn to eat, to walk, how to play together. We go to school. We learn how to make new friends. We start to work and we learn new skills. As we grow, we mature. But do we do the same with our faith? Do we take the time to mature our faith? Do we take time to study and read the Bible? Do we take time to learn from others who are more mature in their faith? Do we take time to invest in others who could learn from us? Do we do everything we possibly can to make sure that we are growing? Or would we just let our faith stay young forever? Today we want to dive in one particular text, uh, specifically 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But I, before I dive into this text, I think it's important to note that Paul wrote long letters to the Corinthians. He wrote 1 and 2 Corinthians, not because they were more mature, spiritually speaking, than the other churches, because you recognize Philippians, Ephesians, Galatians. They were shorter books, weren't they? Why was 1 Corinthians so long and 2 Corinthians so long? It's not because they were more spiritual. It's because they had more problems. In fact, it was a very troubled church. And this church plant was taking place in a very troubled city, a very troubled area. The Corinthians were a, a mixed bag of cultures. Uh, of course, the predominant culture is the Roman culture. Of course, the Romans, when they took over the Greeks, um, they just kind of changed things up a little bit, but the practices were very similar. In fact, the Romans actually hijacked the Greek gods and they just renamed them. And um, so when Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, this is a church coming out of a cesspool of immorality. And they were struggling. This church was struggling. Even though they were embracing the gospel and embracing the gospel message, um, it took them a little longer than a lot of other churches to grow up spiritually because of all these things, the background they were brought up in, the culture they were brought up in, in fact, once they become Christians, it was a very difficult culture to maintain your faith like you should. And, and of course, Paul wrote this letter. In fact, there was actually a letter believed to have been written before 1 Corinthians by Paul. Then he wrote 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And then later on, another church uh, leader by the name of Clement wrote another letter to Corinthians because the Corinthians were were really struggling with a lot of things and they just couldn't get where they needed to be. I never forget, and I, 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 I probably shouldn't tell you this, but keep in mind I was young and sometimes I said things before I thought. I remember one time I, I had a call from a pastor search committee from a church and somehow had gotten my resume a while, you know, this was before I came here. And uh, he said he was so-and-so from Corinth Baptist Church. I said, excuse me? He said, I'm the chairman of the search committee on the Corinth Baptist Church. I said, okay. So he started asking me questions. And at the, toward the end of that inter phone interview, I said, let me ask you a question. Why did y'all name your church Corinth Baptist Church? He says, well, I really don't know. It was just a name to come up with. It was out of the Bible, I guess. I said, but do y'all realize that's the most troubled church in the New Testament? Who in the world will name their church Corinth Baptist Church? Needless to say, I never heard from him again. But um, <laughs> I, I was scared to go to church, to go, go to pastor church with that name, to be honest with you, because the Corinthian church was so troubled, so immature in the faith. And there's five major problems he addresses just in 1 Corinthians alone. The first uh, 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 problem he addressed was this problem of division, 
of taking sides and selecting favorite speakers and that kind of, day, kind of thing. And, and, and Paul was reminding them that there's no church leader that dies for their sins and, 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 and there's no particular practice um, that, that is one that's better than the other. And then he talked about sexual immorality. Sexual immorality was a big, big problem in the city of Corinth. And it was a big problem even within the church. There were unnatural unions. Remember when I'm talking about 1 Corinthians 5, that there's this particular person that's in the church that's having an ongoing affair with his father's wife. Probably his stepmother, but still, yuck. Really? And, and this particular church was, knew that it was going on and didn't do a thing about it. This person that was a professing believer in Jesus Christ professed Christ, yet he said he continued to do what he did, and nobody said anything. And then number three is this problem of food sacrifice to idols or that misuse of personal freedom. In fact, they were abusing this, and, and of course they discovered, which was a good thing, they discovered that all this food that was offered to idols was offered to false idols. They, weren't, they, they discovered they were false gods, so it didn't matter anyway, but there were some as solid as a stumbling block because they felt like you should stay away from food that's been offered to idols. So it became a, a tension in that particular church. And number four, their meetings and how they conducted those meetings they were, uh, they were in, in these communions they would have in 1 Corinthians 11, there were some that were socially honored versus some that were social outcasts and they left them out and, 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 and Paul jumped all over their case and the misuse of communion and the pride in their spiritual gifts. And, and then number five, they talked about this belief that there was no bodily resurrection of Christ. And evidently, uh, some of the... Um, uh, false teachers that got into the church of Corinth and was teaching this, and Paul corrected that and said there was a there was a truly bodily resurrection of Christ. In fact, if there wasn't a bodily resurrection of Christ, then we're all doomed. He said in First Corinthians fifteen. So there was a lot of problems that that Paul had to address to the church at Corinth, and this particular text grabs my attention over and over and over again because I've been doing this full-time for 27 years. 27 years. It makes me feel old when I say it out loud. But I've been doing this for 27 years, and over the years, I have seen this problem in every church I've been involved in. I saw it growing up. As my dad pastored, I saw it as I pastored myself, as associate pastor, as a pastor, and so forth. And I have seen this same problem over and over again. And it's frustrating because I believe the reason why a lot of people get hurt by church folk is this very reason. Let's read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you're not able. Catch that for a moment. Paul was saying, I, I, you should be taking on the meat of God's word, but you can't handle it yet. You can't handle it yet. And then he says in verse 3, for you are still fleshly. And, and some translation says carnal. It means you're... you're you're depending on your own fleshly desires. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, you are, not, are, are you not fleshy, fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, well, I am a Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are, you not, are they not near, mere men? What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered. But God was causing the growth. Paul was saying in essence here, let me pause for a second. Paul was saying in essence here, he says, look, I have my ministry. I'm out there, I'm planting churches as God has called me to plant churches. That's what specifically God had asked Paul to do. Apollos was the one he referred to as one who comes in and waters it. Paul would plant. Apollos was the type of guy that comes in and waters things, cultivates things, 
along the way. And Apollos, a lot of times, was preferred over Paul just simply because Apollos was a great orator. He was a great speaker. Some people enjoyed listening to Apollos, and some people enjoyed Paul, and they were, they were taking sides. And then Paul says, so then, neither the one who plants or the one who waters is anything. God causes the growth. If God's not in anything, I don't care how good a leader is or a speaker is, if God's not in it and the people aren't receptive, they're not going to grow. It's just the way it is. Verse 8, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we're God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building according to the grace of God which was given to me. Now, let me me back up just a second there because I won't get to say this later. When he says in verse 9, we are God's building, God's field, God's fellow workers, in essence, he was saying that, hey, we are partners with Christ. We are in God's field. We are God's field and we are God's building. Uh, And Paul identifies that, uh, gives a little more detail later on because we have become, the Bible says, the what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. We are walking in the, we are walking with the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Every one of us who are in Christ, every one of us is a dwelling place of the presence of God. Have you ever just, just took a moment to really think about that? How significant that is. Verse 10, according to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. He is the foundation. Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show, will show it because it is to be revealed, how? With fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. In other words, and of course there's another text that talks about the judgment seat of Christ. When that time comes, all of our works in Christ will be tested by fire. And it's, I know it's symbolic, but here's what it looks like. Jesus is the foundation of everything that we do. And if you're going to get the best, you've got to build with the right building materials. You can't cut corners. You've got to give your best. Gold, silver, precious stones, if it's tested by fire, it just purifies it. It makes it better. But if you put fire to wood, hay, and stubble, what happens? Gone. Nothing. Nothing's left. Nothing but but ashes. So what does that tell us? He tells us. He says, if any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. But if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Catch this. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. In other words, he's going to barely make it. I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven, I, I hope I'm not barely making it. You hear what I'm saying? Can you imagine standing before Jesus empty-handed? Nothing? Nothing because our works were wood, hay, and stubble? You say, Hilton, what does that look like? Hang on. I believe this text demands, as we look at verses 1 and 2 and 3, it demands that we grow up and put the bottle down. Put the bottle down and eat some meat. Now, it's cute and it's sweet, When we have a little infant in our hands feeding that infant the bottle. You know, when Caitlin was an infant, for whatever reason, she wouldn't nurse, so we fed her the bottle. So when we fed her the bottle, there was was, her little tummy was not ready for that particular milk. She had problems. She was a gassy baby. Man, we went through those gas drops like soda. I mean, 
she was like, yeah, I, I remember one time this morning, Nate, Nate Robertson, he had this huge hand. And when we went over to her house, he would put Caitlin on his huge hand and, and kind of do like that. And she'd calm right down. You know, something about that hand, it was just able to kind of calm her down. And, and we'd use white noise. You know what I'm talking about, white noise? Any of you parents, y'all know what I'm talking about. It's had a gassy baby, a colicky baby. You know, you, you put on the radio really loud, it's always going, <sighs> for some reason that soothes the baby. But we ended up having to put Kent, Caitlin on Alimentum. Alimentum was, uh, was a uh, very expensive formula that, um, that all these proteins are broken down so it's easier to digest. The only problem with Alimentum, I read it one time, it, it smelled, to me it smelled like baby throw up. But had this, on the bottle of Alimentum it says pre-digested formula. I'm like, that's what it smells like. <laughs> um, but that was the only thing for a while. That was the only thing she could handle. But because she was an infant, because she was a baby, it was what she needed. As she grew up, she was able to get regular formula, get cereal, finally get something where she could actually sleep all night. Praise the Lord. I'll never forget the first night she slept all night. Amy and I both ran in there just to make sure she was still alive, still breathing. Because we could not believe that she slept all night. But she graduated, and now she's a steak eater, man. I mean, she loves steak. She loves chicken. Well, most of the time it's chicken. But anyway, um, she's a meat eater, and she, she loves a good meal, and she loves to eat. And she gets hangry if she hasn't eaten. You know what I'm saying? Hangry, hungry, and angry at the same time. Anyway, um, so, anyway so it's, it was so important for her to start with the milk just like any of your kids. But then they have to grow up. They have to grow up. There was nothing more weird and silly than to see a 20-year-old baby with a diaper and a bottle in his mouth. That would just be very strange. Y'all with me? But what Paul was saying in essence, spiritually speaking, the Corinthian churches were looking exactly like that. They weren't functioning properly. They weren't doing ministry properly. They were divided. It wasn't just this division over speakers. It was division over everything. They were a divided church. And Paul was saying to the church of Corinth, it is time to put the bottle down. He wanted to share so much with the Corinthians. But they were not ready because they were not moving forward in their walk with Christ. So it's time to put the bottle down, number one, because personal preference can get in the way of personal growth. Personal preference can get in the way of personal growth. What does it say here in the text? I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. Later on in the text, we see that there's also a group that loves Cephas better. Even he, he, Paul brought that up. Cephas, who was Peter, you know, Peter was the he he probably was the good old boy that got along really well and connected really well with the NASCAR fans. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, I'm joking. Anyway, where, where's Josh? There you are. Sorry, man. Um, but um, he was just that, and I probably would too because I, I'm the type of guy that I'm kind of a country boy at heart. I'm not huge. I'm not huge on NASCAR, but I like to hunt and fish and do all those kind of things. I never have understood. Go straight, go left, go straight, go left. I just never understood that. But anyway, it's okay for those who are... I, I'm just saying, Peter... See, I stuck my foot in my mouth. All right. But Peter, Peter was unique. Paul was very unique. In fact, Paul and Peter had a moment of disagreement because Peter, for a moment, became a hypocrite. Go figure. But anyway, you see Paul, Peter, and you see Apollos. They're divided. You know, I'd rather hear... Paul preach. I'd rather hear Peter preach. I'd rather hear Apollos preach. Apollos is more polished. I want to hear Apollos. In fact, Apollos uses proper grammar. Our pastor doesn't. And I want to hear Apollos more. So they started taking sides. They were focusing on personal preferences. It wasn't just on speakers, but they were really, really focused on themselves. They were focused on just 
doing what they wanted to do and do, and do things the way they wanted. They had their favorite styles, their favorite people. So they took sides. They became cliquish. But can I say something to you today? This same thing has been going on for almost 2,000 years. It's, it, it's not just the church of Corinth. It's the church of Bethel. It's the church of church down the road. I've seen it. I've been here almost 15 years. I have seen this over and over and over again. And I think every pastor that I've ever talked to has seen this similar pattern, this idea that people who have been Christians for years, years, should have already gotten over themselves and moved forward in their walk with Christ. And, and what I mean by that is that you, you can have a lot of, you realize you can have a lot of scriptural knowledge and still be shallow in your faith? Yeah, I know a lot of people like that. I went to seminary with some of them. You can have a lot a Bible knowledge and still not have an in-depth faith because it shows in your attitude, it shows in the way you say things, you deal with things, it shows in the way of things you don't do, that you don't participate in. If you're not committed, if you're not sold out for the Lord, if you're not a slave to Jesus Christ, then there's a problem. But listen, they were so focused on personal preference. And I guess this is one of the things, I guess because I've seen it all my life, it's one of the things that frustrates me the most because the reason why a lot of people leave church is because they see this carnality in the church they're attending. But I try to encourage people all the time. I say, look, every church you go to, you know, there might be some that have more than others, but every church you go to, you're going to have hypocritical carnal Christians. You're just going to, see it wherever you go you can't get away from it i heard a preacher say one time he says man i just uh, i just can't sit in church with a bunch of hypocrites he says well you either got to do that or sit with them in hell i wouldn't have said it that way but anyway i'm just repeating what he said <laughs> but he has somewhat of a point Listen, it's not about the people around you that you're going to be held accountable for. It's you. You're going to be held accountable for you. You. Your mom and your daddy can't step in. You have to be held accountable. You have to own your decisions, your commitment. You're, you're, going, to, you're going to be the one that's going to be held accountable responsible and y'all know as well as I do we, we as parents we, we do tend to especially when they're young we tend to bail them out quite a bit don't we try to soften the blow you know when you get to be adults they have, they're on their own I mean you're still there you're still an advisor still helping still supporting and, and if you're like me they're still on your payroll but anyway um, y you just continue to be a support but in essence every one of us every one of us are going to be held accountable of our own actions but here's the thing that bothers me so much is that in church when you're focused on personal preference when you're looking to get what you want out of church you have the wrong attitude in the first place the right attitude is to come into a church to say, hey, what can I do for this local body of believers? No matter how dysfunctional and as weird as we may be, God, is, God has a plan A. The plan A is to work through his church, and there is no plan B. It's his church. And yes, we're weird. Yes, there's a lot of hypocrites amidst all local churches. I, it, it, there's problems everywhere. As long as you got people, you have problems, Right? No matter where you go, more people, more problems. That's just the way it is. But here, you, you, you've got to learn, I think within a context of local churches, where you learn to deal with problematic people. 
You love them where they're at and do the best you can. Uh, and, and listen, they're, they're going to have... Per- but here's the thing that really, really bothers me. Is that we all tend, it's, it's easy to do, we all tend sometimes to gravitate toward what we want and we try to make the church be what we want. And that's just not biblical. And that's just not Christ-like. It's just not. One of the things I, 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 I've seen circulate, you know me, when I, when I see something that really, really bugs me, I, I tend to say something. <clears throat> I probably shouldn't sometimes, but I do. I'm just, uh, I don't know, I'm just natured that way sometimes. But anyway, um, but one of those things that keeps, for example, I, mean, I can use a lot of examples, but one of the things that keeps circulating around on social media is these articles that say, That if churches don't teach the young people old hymns, they're going to collapse. They're going to fall apart because old hymns teach good theology. Two problems I have with that. Number one, I know a lot of hymns that teach bad theology. I didn't get an amen then. I wasn't expecting one. Number two, the problem is not the hymns being sung or not sung. The problem is parents and spiritual leaders are not teaching our young people Scripture. And you can't do that with just a hymn. In fact, we shouldn't rely on music at all to teach. It should be an encouragement, a praise to God. There's some, there's some, some teaching and some theology. Got to be careful to make sure that you're using proper theology because there's even some new stuff that's bad. But there's old stuff and new stuff that's bad. But here's the point. Deuteronomy tells us that when it comes to our responsibility of parents, listen parents, our responsibility is this, is to saturate our home with Scripture. In fact, the text tells us that when they got up in the morning, they taught Scripture. When they go along the way, I'm using Deuteronomy's words, they post it on the doorpost. You know, and then if you've got good small groups and good small group leaders that's teaching God's Word, amen. You're, you're getting, in fact, you, I think Christians are supposed to grow in circles more than grow in rows. I think that's so important. It's so important. But at the same time, I think if you only go to small group and never come to worship, you know what you're telling your church? That you don't support what they're doing. And all that creates is immature carnality. If you're a Christian and you only go to small groups and you never come to worship, you're carnal. Why? Because you're showing that you don't support what your local church... Listen, I, I wouldn't go to a church if I didn't support it. Would you? Would you, at- would you attend anything in a church if you didn't really support that church or support the leadership? Would you attend it? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'd find a church that I could support. I'd find a pastor that I could support. Because our responsibility in the pulpit, our responsibility in the classroom is to teach God's Word. That's the most important thing we can do to help you walk in your faith. Singing and worship is icing on the cake. It's important, but it's icing on the cake. We need to spend time in the cake. Stop complaining about the icing. I know icing makes a difference. I get that. And some like certain ices better than others. That's where we get back to the problem again because y'all are going to talk about personal preference. Hey, I prefer chocolate. I prefer vanilla. <laughs> but you see the immaturity in that? Do you see that? Do you understand what I'm saying? Personal preference will always get in the way of personal growth. Not only your growth, but the growth of the church. If you're focused on getting what you want, listen, there is so much. I'm going to say this and then I'm going to shut up about it. I promise. One more thing. There's a lot of music out there today and there's hymns still being written. Maybe not the way other hymns are written, but there are still hymns being written. song, And there's so much out there. There's so much good stuff out there that points people to Jesus, you can't cram everything you want into three or four songs every Sunday. You just can't. 
But there's so many great choices out there. So many great things out there. Stop arguing over what, what we should and shouldn't sing and let our worship leaders lead us what God has put in their hearts as they lead you in worship and get over yourself. Now I'll shut up about that. Listen, number two, it's time to put the bottle down. And number two, focus on the source of true growth. Focus on the source of true growth. What is the source? He tells us what the source is in chapter three. This is God's word. Who is the source? Jesus. He's the source. He is the source of true growth. If we're going to grow in our faith, we have to make sure he is foundational to everything we do, everything we say, everything we preach, everything we teach, everything we sing. He must be the source of everything. He is the foundation of the church. So it's time to put the bottle down and focus on the source. Man, if we would just focus more on the source, well, we'd see some things happen. Amen? We would. Number three. It's time to put the bottle down and number three, build properly on the right foundation. Look at the wood, hay, and stubble. If you look at it within its context and understand the first Corinthians as a whole, it's pretty easy to come up with a conclusion what Paul was talking about when he talked about wood, hay, and stubble. He's talking about self-serving. Wood, hay, and stubble is what the Corinthians were having a problem with. They were, they were taking communion improperly, disrespectfully. They were approaching the table of communion without confessing their sins, without getting things right with each other. They were excluding people in their meals and so forth because, you know, that's the social outcasts and we're the socially elite. They were doing it in the Corinthian church. And, 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 and Paul was saying, when you take communion, it's wood, hay, and stubble. It's worthless. You're bragging about your spiritual gifts. That's the problem the Corinthians had too. They were bragging about their spiritual gifts. You know, some of them were talking, in fact, a lot of them were bragging and, es- and kind of exalting this spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. And Paul jumped all over the case. He says, I'd rather speak a few words that everybody understands than a bunch of words in tongues that only you understand. He says, you guys are getting puffed up because you have this gift. Get over yourself, Paul says. So they were bragging about these spiritual gifts. And Paul says, wood, hay, stubble, wood, hay, stubble. All this stuff, when it's tested by fire, poof, wood, hay, stubble. And then there's the gold, silver, and precious stone. What is it? Gold, silver, and precious stone, I believe, is selfless serving. It's when you don't put yourself in the spotlight, but you serve out of the motivation of the love that you have for Jesus. You see, gold, silver, precious stone, that is purposing the good of people, not expecting something in return. In fact, it's a blessing. I don't know about y'all, but isn't it a blessing to bless somebody that you know will never be able to do the same for you? What a blessing to know that. To know that you help. I I, I don't know about you, but there's just so much more encouraging about that. I I like doing things sometimes, and you know, I don't know about you, but I like doing things sometimes for people and and they not have a clue who I am and they don't even hear my first name. I don't give my first name. I just bless them in some kind of way. Man, that's awesome to be able to walk away from that. Knowing that you've purpose the good of a person, not expecting something in return. Listen, that's what I believe Paul was talking about here. It, it's, it's putting yourself over to the side and Jesus being the highlight of everything you do and say. Wow. So when that's tested by fire, what happens? It remains. In fact, it becomes even more useful because it's been purified. So we need to build properly on the right foundation. He says here in verse 14, if any man's work which he has built on it remains, 
he will receive a reward. Once that fire has been lit and his works have been tested by fire, and if it remains, there's a reward. But if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Wow. Yes, we're saved by God's grace. It's not, it's, this is not an anti-grace thing. We're saved by God's grace. And, and, we, and, and we need to understand that. In fact, but if you'll turn to Ephesians, if you have a Bible, Ephesians chapter 2. For by God's grace, verse 8, we've been saved through faith. That, are, not, that of ourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then he says, verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. For good works, which God prepared ahead of time. Yes, we're saved by God's grace. But if you're saved by God's grace, through the channel of faith in Jesus... If you're saved, really saved by God's grace, nothing that you do, obviously. What happens? It motivates you to do good works for the right reason. And you know it's the right reason when few people know, if anybody knows, what you've done. Now, sometimes people find out things you've done, but not because you broadcasted it, not because you announced it, not because you look what I did. It's not that. (laughs) Sometimes people find out things, and it's okay. But always, always, always give God the credit for everything that you do and say. Because if you don't, if you brag about it, if you announce it, talk about it, if you point it out, wood, hay, stubble. Jesus said on one occasion, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. There's a lot to be said about that. So much to be said about that. Folks, one day, down the road, I hope a long ways down the road, but down the road I will no longer be pastor of Bethel Baptist Church. But I hope and pray, my prayer is that I left this place better than I found it. Not because anything should be said about it, it's just that I just want Jesus to be glorified, Jesus to be honored, and souls to come to faith in Jesus. And I never want any church, and this is one of the reasons why um, um, Francis Chan left his church. He was a, he was, this was a huge mega church. He had, he had started from his home and huge church. And he said, it got to the point where people come into the church just to listen to Francis Chan preach. He had become so well-known, such a profound speaker, and he still is a very profound man of God. He left that church because he didn't want that church to be about Francis Chan. He wanted that church to be about not a personality, but a people of God who were doing ministry together, loving each other, co-equal partners in ministry. And now he's doing some other things ministry-wise that's unique and kind of behind the scenes. He'll pop out every now and then, but I'm just amazed when I think about that. Wow, that's cool. And I just hope and pray, I just hope and pray that you will be a catalyst for growth not a hindrance. 
Because if you're carnal and you're not growing in your faith like you should, you're going to become a hindrance, not a blessing. A blessing is a cheerleader. A blessing is like, hey, I may not like everything or prefer everything, but you know what? This church is trying to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, so I'm in. I'm in. You either be all in or all out. Because if you're not all in, you're holding us back, not helping us move forward. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your precious and holy word. God, it's, it, it, sometimes we read it, Lord, and it, and, it, and it hits us. It hits us hard. It hits us hard. And God, this was a, this a tough message, but God, it's a profound message that comes from Paul. Not me, from Paul himself who was inspired by you to write those words as he saw for himself a church that was crumbling because of their carnality. So God, I ask you in the name of Jesus, God, help us, Lord, to be the kind of people that will move forward and want to move forward and be a part of what God's doing here so that we can be effective in this community and the world, God, there's so much potential, not just here at Bethel, but God, other churches down the road that we know of are Bible-believing churches, God. Restoration Church, Salem Baptist Church, God, I could, I could think of Fellowship Community, Lord. It's just, the, na- the list can go on and on of people, Lord, in this community, in this valley, who are doing great work for the kingdom. Father, I just want Bethel to be the church or one of the churches, Father, that it makes a difference in their community, God, that we may not be perfect, but God, it, hopefully they'll see us, Lord, as a church that loves people, that loves their community and willing to reach out with no strings attached. Meet needs in the name of Jesus. God, thank you, Lord, for the privilege you give us every week sometimes, Lord, to meet needs. So God, help us to serve with passion in our relationship with you, but also for compassion for the lostness around us, God. God, when we stand before you, we want to be able to present to you gold, silver, precious stones. So God, help our minds and hearts to be focused where they need to be. And for areas we need work, God, help us Lord, to work on those. Help us to get past those things and just simply move forward. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? Listen, this altar's open. You just want to come and pray. Come and pray. You want to come and pray for somebody. Come and pray for that person that's on your heart. Whatever the need might be, this altar's open.